The navigation acts. Aren't these pretty? First things first, there are a lot more than most people realize. Secondly, yeah, there is a lot more nuance and context than most people realize. There is a reason for this. When you're teaching history, like when you're writing a work of fiction, it is very difficult to bring in a realistic volume of context and nuance. Before anyone starts going off and slagging off their history teacher or anything like this, that's not what I mean. Okay? A history teacher, to teach you all the context and nuance that's on this, we're talking about a university level course where I would have for an entire year, if I was teaching the Navigation Act as a full course, I would have a two hour lecture every week. And there would be a lot of those. A lot of those. 30 plus. Two hour seminar, pretty much every week. Again. And you would be expected to go and do roughly eight hours personal research on a guy on a reading list, and also find your own reading, at least every week while doing that. And you'd be writing essays. So think about that. That's what 120 hours of guided instruction, seminars, loosely guided lectures, instructed, and. 240 hours personal work, so it's 360 hours in total in a university scenario, and that's a beginning point of it. You think about it, because in the UK, you are very unlikely to learn about Navigation Acts. If you do, there'll be five minutes in a class talking about the American Revolutionary War before you get into the Napoleonic Wars. If you're lucky enough to do the Napoleonic Wars module as part of your GCSEs or as part of your A-levels. If you're American, they usually talk about Navigation Acts, but they talk about it from the perspective of the American colonies. And, to be honest, the perspective that it facilitated their own case and arguments to do so. And that's the perspective which is held on. The thinking here, the problem is that, A, that tends to focus everything in on the 1660 Act, when it really as an original act when there is all sorts of other ones. There's even an act in 1651, which technically happens during the interregnum. But also, it, that means you leave out what is the British side of the coin. It's often marketed as a simple thing of, oh, it was British greed. It's not. There is British greed as a part of it. There is, a gre there is greed on merchant uh, merchants as a part of it. That's certainly not not a part of it. But it's a lot more than just that. And the point I'm also trying to make is this. When I do a video, when anyone on YouTube does a video or writes a book, we are trying to fill in that context and nuance to the best of our ability within the limitations. This was limited to 70,000 words. And it had to be produced within a certain time. And unfortunately, that happened during COVID when I couldn't visit Canada and I couldn't visit Australia. And I visited Canada and visited Australia. And uh, if I'm lucky enough to get a third edition, where I hope they will allow me to add an extra chapter, you will find more, far more about the Canadian and the Australian uh, tribals because I have managed to go and do the research in their actual home countries. I didn't feel, despite some people telling me it would be more complete, etc., feel right 
putting those vessels in there and putting their stories in there if I was doing the research based off what other people had written. It didn't seem fair to me. But, conversely, when I'm teaching, I'm often going off the work of others. I am quite often working from the work of others. Because I have to. Because I have a huge range of subjects I have to teach. I have to teach on, and I love to teach on. I love to be lecturer, you know, instructor. On. But I do not have the time to go and spend the years in archives talking to people, etc., to go and do the primary research on Warplan Orange. So if I'm teaching Warplan Orange, I owe it to Edward S. Miller. It's my interpretation largely of what Miller's writing. If we're talking about the Stuarts, if we're talking about the War of the Free Kingdoms, we're talking about all these different parts of history. I have read a lot of books on it, and I've had to. But one of the guiding threads, of course, for me is going to be Nicholas Rogers. I don't agree with everything he writes. No historian ever does agree with everything another historian writes. But it is the biggest, the Command of the Ocean is the biggest and probably best in terms of collective bringing together of the Royal Navy's experience and the Royal Navy, and there's politics and organization going around the Royal Navies. But again, saying that, He's not read in isolation. When I'm talking about Nicholas Rogers and his command of the ocean, I'll also probably bring in Jan Gleet and Richard Harding. So, I will take four books. And they'll form a section of my research. But I will also bring in things like this book, the British Historical Statistics by Mitchell from Cambridge. I will bring in a whole suite of books I have on the various politics of various kings, rulers. I have autobiographies of Oliver Cromwell, of Charles II, Charles I, James II, James I. All those things I have up there. And I'll bring it together. And I've got works by American authors on the colonies, on the cause of the American Revolution War. And I bring, I add it all in. And so what you are getting is a synthesis of all of that put through my experience, i.e. my experience doing research. The, to an extent, my cynicism when it comes to certain sources. And my approach to the historical research. All these things are where it comes together. So, where does this all start? Well, it doesn't start with the Navigation Acts. It starts with the War of the Three Kingdoms. It starts with what's sometimes just referred to as the English Civil War, but that misses out the fact that we have a unique circumstance going on. We have a king who's using ship, who's raising ship money in counties more than he's supposed to do, which is kind of an important thing. Ship money is something which has been voted through by Parliament. Um, he'd also been taking tonnage and poundage, which he hadn't been voted by Parliament. And tonnage and poundage is the traditional customs duties which you could get as a monarch in the UK on stuff which is coming through the UK and provides the king with a large amount of their income. So you had tonnage and poundage, and you had navigate, you had ship money. And the thing is, the king wasn't spending that money as he was supposed to. Basically, tonnage and poundage and ship money, what were they supposed to do? They're supposed to fund and maintain a navy. They're supposed to fund and maintain the king doing the things which the king is supposed to do for the defense of the realm. Ship money maintains a navy. Tonnage and poundage uh, is supposed to help maintain coastal fortifications and 
the UK and various other positions for the king around the country. It's not directly linked to coastal fortifications, so please don't go with that or don't write in the comments, oh, it wasn't directly linked. No, but it's along with the Crown Estates supposed to go towards the continuing running and upkeep of various crown castles and crown proper crown forts. These include things like Pendennis. These include things like Berwick-upon-Tweed. Um, all these things are various fortifications which are supposed to be maintained thanks to the incomes accrued. Now, by tradition, you are voted in through Parliament the right to raise tonnage or poundage, i.e. no taxation without representation. Lovely catch-all, but not quite correct, because let's be honest, the representation is of who? Who gets to vote? Does everyone get to vote? No. It's not that system at all. But, anyway, there is a dispute going on with Parliament, between Parliament and the King. And it comes to a head because there is a dispute going on in Scotland as well. And remember, they, they aren't union. There isn't, it hasn't been active union yet. They're not the same country. And the King goes to Parliament to want them to pass a bill which will allow him to raise taxes to raise an army to deal the Scots. Parliament doesn't trust him. He's not using the money for what he's supposed to be doing, that he is allowed, he is allowed to raise. He's, he's expanding it and he is wanting to use raise an army now, and Parliament doesn't trust him not to use it on them. So the main issue is not just raising the money. That's not the main issue of dispute with the King. No, the main issue is who's going to command the army? <laughs> By tradition, the King commands the army, but the uh, Parliament don't trust him to. They don't trust them to. And that leads to a dispute between the King and Parliament. And leads to a very interesting scenario where you have basically the King kicked out of London. And you have a nice old civil war that goes on. And we all know what goes on in that. It's various backs and forwards. Basically, Charles I proves to be as inept militarily as he is inept politically. And despite having some fairly good advice from some people, he decide he doesn't use it. And he manages he gets himself Well, not just captured, but also captured, handed over, killed because of that largely, because he just cannot keep an agreement. He fundamentally believes that a king doesn't have to keep an agreement with anyone who's not a king. And even then, it's variable. You can't do a deal with a person like that. You can't negotiate with a person like that. So, the 1651 Navigation Act comes through after the war is over. Notice? Goes on to 53, but basically the English Civil War part of it is over in 51. What are they doing? Well, the 1651 Navigation Act put in by the uh, Rump Parliament is to protect Britain from the Dutch. Yeah. There are all sorts of agreements trying to go back and forth with the Dutch, and you know, possible alliance. At certain points, they consider uniting the two countries. Uh, when the Stadtholder dies, frankly, that dies too, uh, too and the Dutch realise they have to backpedal quickly because the British might have been more interested in it than he, they thought they would be. There is also the fact that you can argue that after the. Um, when the war is over. Pretty much, the UK is united. We used the 1707 Act of Union as the point of the United, of the United Kingdom's being created, but um, let's be honest. By the time the 
civil war is over, there is one power and one voice in the United Kingdom, and that is the Lord Protector Cromwell and the army. Anyway, they have a problem. The Dutch are dominating the trade. Not just the global trade, not just the trade with the English colonies, but the trade around England itself. They have the vast majority of merchant vessels, and they're going up and down, and they are earning a lot of money from it. And this is undermining two things for the English. One, it's making it not so profitable to be a merchantman for the UK. Merchant shipping, etc., it's more expensive. It's uh, difficult. Because, think about it. If the Dutch keep undercutting you, you can't afford to be a merchant vessel or a merchant crew. If you can't afford to, you sell your ship. Get out of the business, probably. In which case, you're not ordering a ship. If you're not ordering new ships, no one's ordering, and probably no one's ordering new ships. That means the industry starts to die. And that also, as the industry dies down, it becomes more and more expensive, because there's fewer and fewer people who can build ships. And so it becomes more expensive and more difficult to get ships. So pretty much the Navigation Act is twofold. One, it's to protect British merchants, but it's also, more importantly, to make sure that the British merchants are actually able to buy, are going are going to be there to buy British ships because you need to maintain a certain level of shipbuilding in order to maintain the necessary infrastructure for Britain to build ships. We talk about the Royal Dockyards, but they're not existing in isolation. They don't. You need to have a healthy commercial shipbuilding sector for them to feed off and to feed off them. You need to have that relationship running around. You need to have all the various stores, the things that are machine. Otherwise, either all the cost falls on the government, and then the government's in trouble, or alternatively, and this is not, un not impossible, the government could face economic disaster. Because if all the merchant goods, the movement of goods, and remember, at this point, we're not talking. There isn't a massive. There isn't a mass road network. There isn't a mass rail network. There isn't any. This is mass transit. This is the heavy goods vehicles of the day, the time. Ships. If all these are owned by another country, then that other country, especially if you're entirely dependent on moving those goods around your country by the sea, controls you. So there's a very real fear in Britain of becoming a Dutch colony by de facto because the Dutch supply all the merchant ships moving the goods around. Anyway, there are very incidents which lead to the First Anglo-Dutch War. It's that the Navigation Act of 1651 is sometimes put down as a cause, but let's be honest, it's not. It really isn't. Um, mostly it's because there's a dispute over who's going to be the leading Protestant nation. Okay? You now have a very militant Britain. A very, very militant Britain. It's not called Britain, it's called England. But, it's the facto is, the Lord Protector's government is the government of Britain. He's militarily destroyed everyone else. They can, they, they're independent in name only. Just ask them, if they're going to go, you know, if it's the Scottish army. You want to fight the... Do you want to fight the new model army? No, thank you. And they're gone. There's a reason why when Charles II is put on the throne after and the restoration monarchy happens, it's done by Monk, who is the general in charge of Scotland. He has a large army up there. It's a well-trained army. He marches it south. The other generals along the way, he's one of the more senior ones, they decide to join him. Afterwards, he's made the Duke of Albemarle. So, there is a theme going on here. The Battle of Texel is an interesting battle because two things happen in this war. One, the Dutch get beaten up heavily. 
Two, the Dutch beat up the English heavily. Basically, the Dutch find that in home waters, they get smashed because the English have a huge collection of large ships of line warships. The Dutch find that anywhere abroad, they win because they have a huge selection of much larger merchant vessels that can be quickly converted into warships, which they can send out around the world. The Dutch, after this war, go and build some warships and actually make it the rule that the Admiralties are not allowed to sell them off to become merchant ships. <laughs> uh, they actually go, we're going to build these things, you are not going to sell them. You sure? They can make a healthy profit. No, you're not. Do not. And, yeah, the Dutch war is, the Anglo-Dutch war is an interesting war. It's arguably the first Navigation Acts war, but it's not really. Because the thing is, for the British, it was a massive thing in terms of the Dutch involvement trade. For the Dutch, the British trade and the trade between Britain and the colon is colonies was a minute portion of their trade. They didn't even register that they had as much control of it as they did. Just so cheap for them. Just nothing. And the war actually is pretty much is just caused by This is going to sound strange. It is more of a debate about who should have access to what colonies, who should have trade, and it's more to do with the uh, more to do with the growing eastern trade than it is the western trade, because again, the North American colonies do not generate that much money. Caribbean generates money. South America generates money. The Far East generates money. North America just doesn't. Anyway, there's a small problem. When the royal, uh, the monarchy is restored, restored technically, officially, the inter uh, interregnum the period between monarchs, the whole Commonwealth and Lord Protector of it ceased to exist. I do love the fact that that was called it was called a Commonwealth during that period and then what was the name that was selected for the uh, post-empire organization of uh, nations by Britain? Commonwealth. Has a nice historical overtones which I'm not sure if Everyone realised when it became when you find that the uh, poster person for put, uh, putting it through was the Queen, but I think more than likely, if anyone understood the understood it and probably got a giggle out of it, it was probably the Queen. And considering the amount of times that um, Churchill tried to get Oliver Cromwell and uh, a ship a battleship named Oliver Cromwell, I am so tempted to think it was him who put that one through. But actually, they've been talking about potentially forming a Commonwealth for about mm, the first discussions of it really 1880s, 1890s. What to do with them dominions? They're becoming, they're pretty much de facto going to be independent. It's far easier to lead a band of willing volunteers than it is to try and drag a horde of people in chains. So, the 1660 Act. Well, neat tonnage and poundage going on behind there. But vessels had to belong to people uh, to the people of England or built of and belonging to people of English possessions. I.e. you either had to be English or an English colony. Crews had to be 75% English rather than a majority. The 
previous Act, 1651, had required a majority. Counts required a post of bond to ensure compliance and would recoup the funds upon arrival. Back at their starting port. Uh, it's an interesting scenario. Um, there is a dispute as to whether it's back at their starting port or it's back at, it's at the, their, um, the port they go to. It depends which port you're going to where the system seems to run. Because whilst there might be an official system of how it's going to run, there's also an unofficial system of how it's going to run. And also depends on how much money the governor in that area actually has. Because sometimes it was posted from them, their personal funds. Ouch. Right. As applying to cargo, it also created enumerated commodities that could only be shipped to England or other English colonies. Now these include things like sugar, tobacco, uh, cotton wool, indigo, ginger, fustic and dying woods. Now, the thing is, what do these matter? Well, let's be honest. Sugar? That matters. That's a major, a major, a major import at this point. So is tobacco, cotton wool. You need that for clothes. Even this time. Indigo and ginger. Mmm. Dyes. And taste. It's often forgotten just how important ginger was for a while. We, we look at these days and it's just part of our everyday activities, but for a while ginger was a major, major cost. Now, alongside Navigation Acts, you also have things called the Customs Acts. Oh, they're fun. Customs Acts often filter into Navigation Acts. For example, in this case you have well, pretty much two. Um, the Customs Act in 1662, though, is the one which really matters because it defines Englishmen. Whereas if required by Navigation Act that in the sundry cases the master and three fourths of the marin mariners are to be English, it is to be understood that any of those majesty subjects of England, Ireland, and its plantations are to be accounted English and no others. Now, remember, of course, that during, and here's another interesting thing to think about, during the Interregnum, when it was the Commonwealth, basically, Scotland was included in that. However, <gasps> post the Restoration, when they are technically divided once more, it's fun. It is a whole interesting bit of history going on. Now, the thing is, the Scots also pass similar navigation acts. And you also have to remember there is a bit of a competition going on between the Scottish Parliament and the English Parliament. And there's also things like Tobacco Planting and Sowing Act, which prohibited the growing of tobacco in England and Ireland. Um, and an Exploration Act in the 1660, which was you know, the Exploitation Act in 1616, not the Exploration Act, that's a different act, that's later on. This is the trouble when you have a list of acts <laughs> it's on the side, you're sort of going, mm, oh, that's, oh, no, that's 1662. Just to make sure I get the dates right. Again, other people have bullet points of notes of what things they want to hit. I do. And then you tend to have also lecturing trick key things you need to remember. Me, it's dates of the acts because a lot of the acts have similar names, and a lot of the acts, in terms of their short form name, I've also included their long form name up there. Um, a lot of the acts have very similar dates. They're 1660, did a 1660, did. So I have a list there. Doesn't mean occasionally I read it off wrong when I'm worried. 
And as you can see, this one was originally an act for the encouraging and increasing of shipping and navigation. And before anyone tells me that's not how you spell encouraging, that's not on me. That's on the Parliament of 1660. So if you want to debate the spellings of, it, of English there with them, please invent a time machine and go back and do that. But if you wouldn't mind on your way, I have some plans I'd like you to drop off of Jackie Fisher. Don't go killing anyone. That'll just that'll just mess with the timeline. But happily go have the debate about English spelling with them and just drop the plans off me. Now, again, what is this about? Well, this is about two things. It's about people of England are built of and belonging to people of English uh, possessions. So it's to encourage, it also is encouraging British shipbuilding Secondly, it's encouraging recruitment of English sailors. Why is that important? One, builds up your industry and your capacity to build ships, merchant ships and warships. Also allows people buying cannon, people buying all sorts of other systems which are useful for you in growing your own industry, your own maritime industry, industry, infrastructure. Secondly, how do you crew ships at this time? Well, if you think about it, warships are laid up in ordinary. That means they're not crewed. And then they're commissioned, which you, you have to pull a lot of sailors. Where are you going to get those sailors from? You don't have a pool of sit people sitting around going, oh, I'm a really experienced sailor. I'm just going to sit here and wait for the next 10 years until you have a war to call me. No. You maintain your pool by having a thriving merchant naval community. That is your pool of sailors. That is your key people who you're going to draw upon in war to man your warships. So saying that the sailing masters and all those personnel have to be English, that's your pool of sailing masters, of experienced sailors. Saying the crews have to be English, that's your pool of sailors of people who are going to be the topmen, who are going to man the sails and do all the, ri do all the rigging on the ships. It's... Yes, it is also giving official legal advantage to your merchants. But that is in a way giving them the necessary financial incentive by giving them this advantage to do your work for you. So you don't have to pay for a standing navy. So you don't have to pay massive orders to build this infrastructure. Your merchant, your capital class, in terms of their you know capacity to grow things, they'll do it for you because it's in their interest to do it for you. So yes, you are motivating the merchants by greed because this is, this is giving them an opportunity to make money. But you're doing it for more reasons than just making money. Yes, you're going to make tax off those people when they're, when they're doing their trade. That's good for your economy and good for your government to be able to do anything with it. Not that the governments do much at this point with the money they make, but they do do some things. Um, and navies are not cheap. They're not. In any period, navies are not cheap to maintain. And a large amount of the money that's made from this kind of merchant does go towards the navy in peacetime. It's a sport that sustain it. So, in 1663, three years later, a year after the Customs Act, you have another thing come through. Right then. In addition to the previous regulations, this act introduced transshipment for goods. Furthermore, the trade had been carried in English vessels and that's really referred as bombs or those of its colonies. So it firmed up that the merchant ships involved had to be English built ships, English owned ships, as defined. Remember, by 77, Scottish are included in that because of the Act of Union, but that's 44 years away at this point. At this point, the Scottish are doing their own mirror acts. So why has transshipment come in? Why are they now insisting that all goods come to the UK, come to English ports, get offloaded, and then load onto other ships to go uh, to go to colonies? Why do they want to turn it? 
do that? Well, there's three reasons for this. One, it is again going to build port capacity. How do you get people to invest in infrastructure, i.e. In ports you need at home to grow your merchant fleet, but also to grow your uh, capacity to load and prepare warships, and to increase the number of ports you have around the UK that are functioning ports able to take large ocean-going ships? You need to increase the demand of them. Or you need to pay a lot of money as a government. This increases demand, and so other people will have to pay. But it'll be in their interest to pay, because if they do, they'll be able to get make more money legally. Because they're able to charge for all this. Secondly, do you have AIS, as in the system that we use for tracking ships around the world? No, not in the spirit. Do you have satellites? No. Your only ability to check that ships are doing what they're supposed to do, be doing is if they have to call in for port in places they're supposed to and get the proper documentation. And if they don't, then at somewhere along the line you hope there is someone who is legitimately doing their job and not just taking bribes who will spot the, who will notice the lack of proper documentation and will impound the ship. This is where you have customs officers involved. So this creates that. And thirdly, this is an important thing. We are starting to see the emergence of London as a major entrepot and a major growing mecca of tra uh, global trade. And this in many ways is about widening that out. One of the interesting things about Britain versus the rest of Europe in terms of its um, development is that Britain is at turn... At turn behaves a bit like a city-state, a commercial city-state, I like Venice and Florence and um, Genoa. More Flint, Venice, and, Venice and Genoa, really, than Florence, but Florence is, does there a bit apart. And, you know, it's this commercial hub, and that's why London has its own train bands, its, I, its own armies, its own, you know, all sorts of things, is that London is in many ways a city-state within a nation, and the economic hub within a nation. So whilst Britain is a territorial ter inter uh, uh, territorial entity, so it's like a na is a nation state, it also has a de facto city state within it. Another part of that is, of course, the East India Company, and that is starting to grow up at this time. That is the the parts of that that are going to come into existence, uh, that's sort of really going to grow, are starting to come together, and. There is a development of things going on to grow that trade, and that's another reason why you want to have this act. You know, I British of all possessions around the world, the trade goes through the it grows through England. It allows you to have control. Now, then you have the Second Anglo-Dutch War, and this really is far more to do with what's going on in the East than what's going on in the West. But again, there is a part of it which is a problem, because the Dutch have advantages. They have New Amsterdam, etc. So, land border, goods go across, and it's all winking, wink through. There's all sorts of things happening and taking place. And that's also why one of the reasons why um, New York becomes the economic hub of the colonies, because of this trade scenario, and they've been trying to get round... Uh, the English trade. Now, there are legitimate reasons for it. For starters, it costs more if you have to transship it through the UK, through English ports. But, you also have to deal with the fact that you are more limited in terms of your markets if you have to transship it through the English, English ports. So yeah, there are good reasons for what the, the for what the uh, the American colonists are doing, but there are also issues of it. In that they are acting, and even in this period, they have started the Caesar side again of the differences between them and England. One of the interesting fundamentals is that many of their colonists 
to an ex uh, coldness to a large extent, especially the early ones, leave England because their interpretation of what the British Constitution should say and what the British Constitution does say is different from that of the majority of the population. And they wished for a stricter religious uh, order than what they were being provided. They didn't fit. And it was becoming problematic. Now, you have to remember that whilst there had been a rise, a rise in certain extents, of English persons who had felt displaced religiously post the Restoration because for a while Britain had become for a large uh, part of the thing stricter religiously in terms of its form of Protestantism and this had made some feel more content when the restoration came there was I, w I don't want to use this word but it is the only word that you can really use to describe it a liberalization this was in part by Charles II trying trying to build the ground that his brother who would become James II could actually move into if James II had been as smart and as politically able as his elder brother. But James II wasn't. He was a decent general, decent admiral, he was not a good politician. That is why all the the whole William and Mary, uh, uh, William and Mary and the whole scenario of um, the uh, glorious revolution when the um, <laughs> the Dutch get invite, basically get invited in to take over uh, happens because James II was Catholic and just as you had issues in England and Scotland in terms of not being Protestant enough for some and to fit with the majority the majority were not also happy with someone being Catholic being on the throne because they had memories of what Queen Mary had done it wasn't as long ago as you might like to think at this point a lot of people had had relatives who had survived what Queen Mary had done so the idea of a Catholic being on the throne and the idea of burnings and when when the British start to talk about papal uh, control and papism what they're basically meaning is yeah they, they burnt us because they didn't like us because we weren't Catholic enough. And pretty much that's the issue you have with the English scenario, in that they don't like... It's an early in, it's an early in inoculation, really, and it still carries on for a bit after Mary. So please don't... I mean, uh, don't, please don't get me wrong. Please don't think it's it's all gone one way, etc. All went away after Mary. No, it didn't. There were still those things. But basically, religious extremism, political extremism, in term for a long t period for Britain, get ironed out by the experience of Ma uh, experience of Mary and its gradual seeping into the national memory, and by the Civil War, because the Civil War had been the rise of the merchant class and the middle classes and it's what gave them the voice in British discussions it's what it led to an increase in the franchise and the number of people who could vote and the number of people who would have a, a, role in par a role in parliament and the important role of the commons it's one of the interesting things is that it's from this period onwards that the Commons starts to have a greater and greater role over the Lords. And whilst it doesn't happen immediately, it's not too many hundred years, hundreds of years until someone from the... Uh, it can no longer is possible for a member of the House of Lords practically to be Prime Minister. Theoretically, yes. Practically, no. 
practically you have to be an MP. You have to be an elected member of parliament. Now, however that election goes, and remember some of those boroughs are pretty rotten, okay? I, I do love the fact that someone was trying to tell me the other day that, you know, it's... I think they were trying to say it's American Republicans who've developed gerrymandering, who developed ger gerrymandering and, and um, you know, real, really organizing their uh, constituencies so they're kind of interesting. And I went, no! That's been going on for as long as there's been people being allowed to vote. I mean, there were times in which a hill, a uh, castle hill in a, in one part of England had two MPs, despite having a population of about 40 sheep. I'm sure the sheep enjoyed plenty of representation. I'm not sure if any of the necessary concerns they had about lambs were taken into consideration. I have a feeling any who barred too much were eaten. Anyway, Tobacco and Plantation uh, Trade Act of 1670, basically. Uh, why is this included? Well, it's also a Navigation Act. Uh, it's uh, technically an act to prevent the planting of tobacco in England and for regulating the plantation trade. Now, as part of many of its criteria, and it did have several interesting criteria in it, uh, it also required that there be penalties. So require the governors of American plantations to report annually to Customs Head Office in London a list of all ships loaded any commodities there, as well as a list of all bonds taken. But this is more about making sure the East India Company has access to enough materials to stop it, the Dutch being able to buy it up, because one of the compositions, of course, is taking tobacco backwards and forwards, right? And sugar backwards and forwards. And one of the problems that had been happening was ships which were supposed to be taking sugar and tobacco to the UK had been heading to the Netherlands. Yay! Lucky them. And um, that meant the East India Company didn't have the goods to, to take to India to sell. Or the fur further east. So yeah, this is that is about greed, but it's also a case of what's this money doing? What is it doing? It's enriching the Dutch, who we are fighting wars with. So, basically, you are trading with a nation which we keep fighting wars with, and allowing them to get richer and therefore afford a better and more capable fleet, which is the main thing we are fighting. So, it, it, you're not only it, it, the trade is not only there for that point, undercutting the East India Company's profits and the bill of Britain to make tax uh, and the English government's taxes, but it's also strengthening the enemy. There is a greed factor there, yes, but there is also a. Um, Excuse me? It's not quite the way cricket's played. So. Then there's the Third Anglo-Dutch War, which is just... Yeah, that's just not a good war for the... A good war for anyone. That's basically, it's a, a subsumed part of the Franco-Dutch War. And that then leads to... Well, during it, the Navigation Act of 1673. Or the, an encouragement for the uh, an act for the encouragement of the Greenland and Eastland trades, and for better securing the plantation trade. It allows whaling ships to have 50% English crews. Why? Because whaling ships go away for a long, long time, and most of those crews, which are not English, are either Scottish or no Scandinavian. In which case, it doesn't really matter. Plus, they're away from England for a long time, so. If you have the sailors going off on whaling ships, then you don't have them to be able to call to warships. Whereas if they're on a merchant ship, they're going backwards and forwards. So you're mostly going to have to wait a few weeks for them to be there and in the pool. However, there was also a practical reason for it. Another practical reason for this. 
You notice it also uh, stop, destroys the Eastland Company, which is another interesting organization, which have basically monopolized English trade officially with the Baltic regions and Scandinavia. Now, the thing is, they weren't bringing in enough stores. There were not enough stores coming in, especially ship stores. And if you go toward the Dutch, then they can inter they can interdict that trade rather easily because of the trade routes. So if you open it up to other nation ships, a those powers aren't the same threat to you as the Dutch are, and b it hopefully builds you uh, closer links with those powers, and c if the Dutch attack a Norwegian ship or a Swedish ship or a Danish ship. They could find themselves at war with the Norwegians, Danish, or Swedes. And let's be honest, you don't want to go to the war with the Swedes in this period. The Swedes are a romping, stomping, we will do you do nasty things to you organization in this period. In this period, they are not a nice group to take a pick an argument with. In fact, as a whole, you avoid picking an argument with the Swedes. So, it made sense. So far, most of this has been about stopping the American colonists from trading with Britain's enemies and growing Britain's infrastructure, maritime infrastructure. Yes, it also is also about making Britain rich, England rich, but that's every country's out to make itself rich. The reason they make themselves rich is because that's how they make themselves strong. It also makes their people happy, but it makes themselves strong so they can win wars and they can grow richer and bigger and keep surviving. It's not a virtuous circle, but it is a logical circle. It's not excusing it, it's explaining it, please note. None of this is particularly nice, but it's mechanicalism and it's one of the thing, uh, big things I have problems I have with a lot of the other economic systems, other than capitalism, which again has problems with it, especially when it's been, in many ways, suborned and uh, and uh, and uh, twisted, is that a lot of them are based in mercantilism. Mercantilism is not a good economic system, not if you want peace. Because basically, it means it, mercantilism is about control of resources, control of land, control of people. Basically, you're rich if you control those things in the under mercantilism. And you can argue that socialism and etc. All these things. They have varying means of construction. They mean the people can uh, people own, own this, etc. etc. The people have a say in it. No, uh, yes, but that doesn't. Uh, groups of people are no less greed, greedy than individuals. It's the basic rule of life. Whilst you might be, uh, like to believe that everyone is going to be a lovely person. And the great thing is to do with history students is to go, is to ask them about the past, and they go and go. You say, what do you think? They always imagine they would have been a wonderful person in the past. They would have been one of the virtuous few. And there is not. There is a percentage chance. There's always a chance. There's always a virtuous few. But the vast majority of the people go along with the uh, go along with things because it's an easy life, and they've got other things to think about. And they've got more other things in their life which they're working on. You are the vast majority. Of you are probably going to be the vast majority of people. Well, yeah, you know, it's a it's a nice thing to believe you're part of that. You're going to be a part of the virtuous few. We can all believe, but there are certain issues today I will stick my neck on the line for. There are a vast majority of issues, though. I consider how much skin I have in the game and how much interest I have, and I just go, "What's the majority opinion?" And I will wander along with that and just tolerate it. There's only so much time I have in there, so many hours. Even a functioning Sonic. So, if that's what I'm like, and I know how much research I put into most things, and how much time I do have, because I'm quite lucky in that I have no dependence at the moment, I have 
nothing else to absorb my time other than I, in this in this summer at the moment, so I don't even have to go into le to give lectures. I'm doing it all online when I do it. If all that is the case, if I'm not interested enough to go and look into it, then why would I expect people who are busier than me, who have far more full lives and far more commitments than me, to be having any more time to go and do so? So, Navigation Act of 1696, an act for preventing frauds and regulation abuses in the plantation trade. Now, what do we think this is about? Because it's a Navigation Act. What's it about? Is it plantation trade? It's, you know, what is it? Well, this is where things start to get really kind of interesting. Because it's the 1696 Act, which actually starts to require the registration of all ships and owners, including an oath that they have no foreign owners before the ship would be considered English built. And in the time period that we're talking about, oaths have very, very real consequences for the people who uh, uh, people who swear them. Exceptions were introduced for foreign built ships taken as prize, or good for the Royal Navy. Or those employed by the Navy for importing naval stores, again, uh, whilst naval stores are things like rosin, tail oil, uh, pine oil, and turpentine, um, from the plantations, there's all sorts of other things as well they're including. Basically, again, it's something to make the Navy's life easy, but also to uh, have an impact upon the, for want of a better word, upon the Scandinavian trade and the Dutch, uh, the Navy actually included in the use of Dutch and Portuguese ships on occasion to get these resources out of the plantations in America because of the Caribbean because there weren't enough English ships available and they needed to get the supplies to build their own ships and man their own ships. The deadline for registration of ships was originally to be 12 months, but was extended by the Registering of Ships Act in 1697. In an added bonus, they set up that any revenue generated from any suing or enforcement under the Act would be split in thirds between the King, the Governor, and the one who informed. Uh, this was a nice way of incentivizing information, and let's be honest, it's going to make a few people rich. Furthermore, the Act, and this is a really cool thing, gave colonial custom officers the same power and authority as custom officers in England. These included the ability to board and search ships and warehouses, load and unload cargoes, seize those imported or exported goods prohibited for you, or those for which duties should have been paid under the Acts. And all that sounds great, but from now on, these custom officers would no longer be appointed by the governors. They would no longer be the they would no longer be the local governors choosing them. They would be, well, they'd be appointed from England. They'd be representatives of the English crown. They would be, de facto, not one of the governor's people. So the governor gain an instrument which is of more power in their organisation to be, uh, how do I put this, to, ha to be able to deliver more on these policies, but they also, in the case of corrupt governors, which were always a potential, uh, they lost some power and influence because they could no longer control who, host, who hold, held these powers, who could have carried out these duties. Now, here is where you have a small issue starting to come up, because these are colonies. They are colonies. And that is a problem. Because a colony, by de, uh, by de facto, is at the mercy of the nation state for whom it is a colony of. I.e. the nation state which provides its protection, which provides its support, which provides the banking mechanisms that protect it, and probably the vast majority of the people who have formed the colony. However, there is an issue with this. Because if you have a certain perspective on the English Constitution, 
and that's a romanticized percep uh, percep uh, perception uh, perspective that really uh, suits your own benefit, uh, suits your own uh, needs rather than necessarily the reality of it. You can get, you can start to think, well, hang on, you know, we are English. We have been told we're English the whole way through, forgetting the phrase English possessions. Why do we not have representation in the House of Commons? Please note, again, not everyone gets representation in the House of Commons. The, uh, the franchise is very limited. <laughs> so it's one of those things, the universal franchise. No, we're talking post-World War One, really? And that's for men, and women as well to come in a bit off that. It's just... It's, it's an interesting circumstance we're talking about. So, again, when people are saying, uh, you know, no taxation about representation, they're not saying representation for everyone. They don't mean everyone. They usually mean them. They feel they should be represented. They don't feel the person down the street should be. Now, this gets more complicated when we have the Molasses Act of 1733 which is described here as an act for the better securing and encouraging the trade of his majesty's sugar colonies in America. Now, principally, this is because the Americans American colonies have been trading with French colonies in the Caribbean and taking sugar from them. And that's a problem, because this triangular trade structure is what is making people rich, not trading backwards and forwards with America. America really isn't the American colonies because we have this view of America today as this very rich, very powerful nation. People often go back and think and presume the American colonies were very rich and powerful. At one point, I think it was Jamaica was generating enough tax revenues that it was equivalent to the entire American all of the 13 colonies combined for about 2-3 years, possibly 5 years. I seem to remember one person writing, and I was right a year. Um, it doesn't really matter. The order of magnitude of taxation coming from other sort of from the other colonies means that America really doesn't have that much of a, a financial generation for the UK or uh, for Britain. And this, remember, is post the Act of Union, so this is. 26 years into the United Kingdom of Great Britain. And the trade is important. This triangular trade is important because it's taking mass production produced goods to Africa. Taking advantages of the wars in Africa to use the people which are the product of those wars in terms of slaves, captives, to take them to America. You're selling them there, in America, in the Caribbean, and then using the money from that to buy the t sugar, tobacco, and cotton to take to Europe, where you sell it for a massive profit. And the real finance, and the real money in all this, is the movement of the goods. It's not the goods themselves, it's the movement of the goods. That's where you start to generate the massive uh, the markup. It's moving uh, because the uh, the go goods in the UK, those goods which are taken it are not that expensive. They're valuable here. The goods here are not that valuable. It's terrible talking about people like goods. I know. And please, I don't need to. Uh, there are, can be, you can make many comments if you want, but this is just for discussion of this as a trade route. Okay. There are other videos where I will quite happily discuss this as a moral issue, and it is a more—it is definitely not a good a good view on the human uh, humanity that for a large part of our history, humans were basically just another resource. But hey ho, it takes a while to evolve, and then moving them across, uh, moving that good, and then again, <laughs> they're cheap here, expensive there, cheap here, expensive there. And that's how you grow your money and grow your income. It's rather a strange thing to think of a human as being cheap, but that was the scenario. 
that was the cheap sauce. But it's the global trade and that's what's growing. Now, the thing about the Massa is it's supposed to make it more difficult for the Americans to keep this and to a buy sugar and stuff from the French colonies because it's then enriching the French colonies. Again, the Americans are basically acting independently. Instead of thinking themselves as a British, as an English colony as part of the United Kingdom as a part of they are thinking themselves as their own independent colonies and doing what's best for them. And you can understand it again. But the thing is at this point, you're pretty much acting with an independent foreign policy. If you're going to be trading with a power which is Britain's opponent and are therefore financing the growth of their colonies against, rather than financing, uh, rather than intermixing and integrating yourself in the economic system of the English colonies, there is a problem going on here. Both sides have a good case to make. Both sides are doing it for greed. It's cheaper to buy it from the French colonies than the English colonies. So that's why they're for the Americans. But for the English, if they don't make them go to the uh, British colonies, then the British colonies might not uh, m might cease to, you know, be financially viable. And also, because again, remember that those Caribbean colonies, Jamaica, remember the values of them. Shoring up those and making those and making sure they're as profitable as possible is, impos is important because they generate far more tax revenue than the Americans do. So we have the Sugar Act of 1764. Now, this is where you get some really fun things coming in. And so I'm going to expand this slide up. The Sugar Act of 74, an act for granting certain duties in British colonies and plantations in Africa for continuing, amending and making perpetual an act of the sixth year of the reign of His Late Majesty of King George II, entitled an act for the better securing and encouraging the trade of His Majesty's sugar colonies in America. For applying the produce, uh, produce of such duties and on duties arise by virtue of said act towards the defraying and disallowing severe drawbacks on exports from this kingdom and more effectually preventing the clandestine conveyance of goods to and from the said colonies and plantation and improving and securing the trade between the same and Great Britain. Now then we consider what was the American response and this is Hello. Oh, oh, you're not liking it. Oh. Uh, from Samuel Adams. And do you not like Samuel Adams? I know you're a corgi. I know, I know you have a very... Pre you, your pretensions of being a royal dog, but you, know, you don't like Samuel Adams? Okay. How many of you have doing before? For if our trade may be taxed, why not our lands? Why not the produce of our lands and everything we possess or make use of? This we apprehend annihilates our charter right to govern and tax ourselves. It strikes our British privileges, which as we have never forfeit which as we have never forfeited them, we hold in common with our fellow subjects who are natives of Britain. If taxes are laid upon us in any shape without our having a local legal representation where they are laid, are we not reduced from the chap uh, character of free subjects to the miserable state of tributary slaves? Now, the thing is, Sammy Allams had actually been a tax collector at one point in his career. And he got so in arrears of not collecting people's taxes, he actually got sued for it, and got forgiven it by his uh, uh, by the colony. I.e., there is, the Americans have not been paying taxes. <laughs> this is part of the trouble. Um, the thing is. Uh, there is a whole sort of layer of things going on here. A vast majority of people in Britain didn't uh, ha paid taxes without having any, any ability to shape uh, the legal representation at all. So this is asking for things people in Britain this time don't have. But leaving that to one side, Yes, we have an elected parliament. Yes, it's called the Mother of All Parliaments. But just look at the franchise that existed in 1764 versus today. And there's a massive, gaping, massive difference between the two. Um, what is this coming from? Well, it's simple. It's quite simple, really. 
the Americans don't like to pay taxes. They have basically been, whilst they were worried about French invasion and various, uh, and I Popish invasion and Popish threats, they were very happy to be part of Britain and at least pay lip service to the United Kingdom, whilst they were in fact uh, de facto actually trading with everyone they could and not bothering about it. And the whole system was interestingly corrupt. The moment they didn't have that threat anymore, well, what are they paying for? And by the way, this is the interesting thing because it's basically the Americans not willing to pay for their own protection. If you consider the, the delightful troubles that the US Navy has had to this day, that various generations of the US Army have had, that US government spending on infrastructure has continually. There is a deep vein, and this comes from. This is not a critique of America. This is a react. Uh, this is a part of uh, sort of America. Of when you look at the foundations, there is a deep vein of people who believe it was better to do it for themselves and didn't really want to be part of the state. There's nothing wrong with that, as an intellectual position. And that's a foundation when they were setting up their charters, but again, it's reading in a lot into their charters and the wording of their charters. It is reading a lot into the foundation charter, the charters, etc. When they're being set, uh, set up, and especially those people who've gone to America to set them up and adapt them and evolve and establish their in initial interpretation of their charter, those are people who had, in a large, uh, in a large way, decided they didn't want to be part of the British system. They didn't want to pay into the British taxes because they didn't want a British army that could oppress them and their religious their religious beliefs, uh, which were different from the vast majority. Tend to be very strict, a much more stricter version of Protestantism. But they also those people hadn't had much of a qualms about imposing those beliefs on everyone else when they had the chance. So, you know, there's that fun going on. And please note, I had family which fought on both sides in the that the, the, that particular war. Uh, in fact, they fought in the Scot. There were officers in the Scottish Army, officers in the Royalist Army, officers in the New Model Army. <laughs> um, <laughs> my family were um, <laughs> everywhere, um, usually getting paid. So I can be rude about them, in that terms of that groups, and I will be quite happily. It's the reality of it. And so the people who gone uh, f uh, gone to America and found America had that you can from one angle call it a self-reliance from another angle you can call it independence from another angle you can call it you can almost say it's a A, beli a belief that the rest of the world happens because it happens. Let me explain it. They're sort of they they want infrastructure. They don't really often realise how much their lives do depend on infrastructure. You can see this in some of the fundamentalist views when people. Uh, I see this in America sometimes when I see descriptions, and we get this. We have this occasion in the UK as well. People with, Magna, with the Magna Carta of variations of sovereign citizen. It's sometimes called. And some of the people I listen to them, and I honestly go, hmm, "That's an interesting point." But others I listen to and go, "Do you like driving on roads?" Yes then you're going to have to pay taxes. It's either that or you're going to have to pay tolls. You, it can either be run by a private company, in which case you're going to be paying tolls because no company's going to do it for free, or you're going to have to pay taxes into a communal pot. That's the, that's the final thing. If you, don't want, if you don't want to be able to move your car around, please don't. Now, we can talk about how the fact that um, we have paid for cars to drive on things, we have to pay taxes, to use so basically the companies which sell us cars are um, not building in any way involved in the infrastructure of 
that actually supports the cars. But there again, they should, in theory, be paying taxes towards it. All their employees are paying taxes towards it. And roads have actually pre uh, uh, roads actually predate cars. So we've had horses and carts with roads. We've had oxen and cart with roads. We've had lots of things. Uh, we also had uh, canals and all sorts of things of moving goods. Canals tended to have private investment to pay for them rather than state investment, but they tend to charge tolls, large amounts of money for the movement of goods. It's a scenario you have to deal with. If you want to make use of these facilities which of the infrastructure or that life and modern civilization brings with it, it tends to have to be supported with money, with money, not just you want it to exist. It's not going to exist on its own. And if you look at roads and their usage, they're always a good case study because if they don't have regular maintenance, they fall apart very quickly. And you can see when governments start cutting money. You don't like the rain or the wind outside? When governments start cutting money in spending, and especially when they cut stuff of maintenance, how quickly those roads go away. So the American Revolutionary War happens, and it happens because, honestly, the Amer we could say it's the Americans don't like paying taxes, but also it's the Americans have now, but have for several hundred years been developing, a lot, for a couple hundred years by this point, have been developing on their own path, starting to pursue their own foreign policy, their own things, and the thing is, the wider English system doesn't interest them as much as they want to be able to trade with whatever parts of it they want to trade with. They want to be able to trade with everyone else. They don't want to be part of the included system. They want to make money. And the thing is, is you're talking about a very small group of people who are actually making money in this. The vast majority of people are not. It's one of the joys of history when you look at it and then people, when they talk about things like um, any part of history when people talk about sort of the owning the means of con uh, uh, the means of production and those sort of things it's usually only a very small number of people who actually own them it is and it's a very small number of people who are actually making this result and one of the things you have to remember about the American Revolutionary War is that there is delusion on both sides the Ameri uh, there is a delusion in Britain that the Americans are more important to our economic and especially our sailor and naval superiority in terms of the number of sailors it generates than they actually were. And the Americans believe because they were the first colonies they were far more important to the British system than they actually were. And the reason you can tell the reality of this is that when it all starts to go wrong and the British make many stupid decisions, they leave, leave um, Lord George Germain in charge. Uh, when it all goes wrong, they drop them. Of the things they can afford to lose when they are trying to, they're the backs against the wall, they're trying to defend everything. 13 colonies are gone. their value is gone. They are things you can afford to lose. It's not a nice thing to think. No one wants to give it, no one wants to, uh, no one wants to take red off the map. It's terrible. But you can afford to lose it. Have the Navigation Acts contributed to all this? Well, people like to Go focus on the 1660 Navigation Act as the original of this, and frankly, no. Every Navigation Act fills into it, but every act is in a way a response usually to Dutch, but later on to French trade with America. And the fact is that the Americans, American colonies from the get-go had, because of the level of the realities of communications when they were originally set up always been slightly more independent. And the people who go out there, I know there are 
some people just like to say, use the phrase religious fundamentalists. They're not. They are a spe there is a large group who come from a specific section of Protestantism in England who and a growing group who come from that who want who basically want to pursue want to ha pursue their own version of Christianity without having to accommodate others because for a while they got to be in charge and set the rules and set the tone so they were free but when they didn't have charge when it started being a period of for want a better way a better phrase religious moderation and to an extent libera uh, liberal uh, liberalism um, mainly in, <laughs> mainly from the Christian perspective but mainly from the perspective of Charles II trying trying to build up the kind of political consensus and commonality which would allow his brother to succeed him successfully instead of what actually happened because his brother did turn out to be as as unable to pick a decent command structure as we uh, as you can fear uh, because he decided to pick people because of their religious inclination or not necessarily their capability of the job which meant all the other loyal officers decided that um, well if we're not going to be picked because of our religion and would a majority uh, why don't we just be not doing anything very easy to not do something. It, the good example is the naval power in the whole Glorious Revolution. The Royal Navy does nothing. They follow them and they have legitimate reasons and Nicholas Rogers and others do great work on this pointing out the legitimate reasons why they do not engage the Dutch. But if they would really wanted to those same reasons could have been opportunities. They were professional enough, skilled enough, they could have done it. They didn't. They didn't want to. And it's the same with the American Revolutionary War. When it comes to a head, really it is not Navigation Acts, it's not the Boston Tea Party, it's none of this. It's being a growing distance between the English Empire and Britain as a nation and how it's moving and evolving and America as a group and organization. They want I wouldn't use the phrase the great British phrase of they wanted their cake and to eat it too. No, what they wanted was they wanted to be able to have a foot in all parties. They wanted to be able to go to all parties. They didn't just want to be stuck in the English party. They wanted to be able to go to the French party and dance with some uh, lovely mademoiselles and go to the Dutch party and find out what clog dancing's like. They wanted to have all the different fun but still have the protection that if anything goes wrong the English party and be their muscle and they also didn't want to pay anything towards the maintenance of the English party because after all they were going to everyone's party so why should they pay so much money into the English party the other parties don't make them have to pay What's interesting enough is that later on in 1849, when the world has moved, started to move really from mercantilism to free trade to capitalism, along with the Corn Laws, Britain uh, passes this, an act to amend the laws in force for the encouragement of British shipping and navigation. And it's this point which is the really the full measure of reverse, because prior to this point, the reason for the first Navigation Act had been that the Dutch were too dominant in British trade. Now the British were the dominant the dominant trade nation in the world. It was British ships which were the majority of the world shipping. It was British ships which sent the to set the tone of the world shipping. Especially on the long distance movement of goods. 
No, we do. we talk about the ocean liner race and the German ocean liners, and that's something they really are building up before World War One. What people don't talk about is tramp steamers, and the fact that the British have a humongous superiority in numbers of them. Those are merchant vessels, just moving goods around the world, just plodding around along, not high speed, not flashy. They're just day in, day out, moving from one port to another port, unloading, loading, constantly moving. Do you want to get up again now? And this act, well, it's great because it allows, for, it encourages free trade for Britain, but it also allows them to go, well, why don't you do free trade to everyone else? And if you're the dominant trading power, free trade benefits you most of all. It helps everyone to an extent because if you liberalise trade and I know this is going to sound like an ideological point but it's actually a backed up by numbers. If you do liberalise trade it does allow goods to more quickly and freely move which allows you to grow your own markets. However it's also true that it massively benefits the largest market and the largest producers. And if you are both, as Britain was in 1849, and this time in that they were the richest market and the largest producer, free trade is really good for you. Do you want to get down there? You do? Okay. And so, there we go. The Navigation Acts. The last one, 1849. Nearly 200 years after the first. Okay. We're going for lunch in a second. We just finished. All right, what have we got coming up? Um, well, this week, hopefully you've seen... What cannon is right for this ship? And next week, we have Dominating the World, Turpits and the Risk Fleet. It's an interesting idea, but it's going to be picked apart. And we've got the 3rd of August. Supposedly was going to be Patron 82. Probably won't be. Probably will not be Patron 82. Probably I'm going to flick it around because the vote's going to go live today. So I doubt I'll leave it till Thursday. I'll give it till Thursday and then do the video. I think I'll flick around something. Hello. Right. Thank you very much for watching. Hope you enjoyed. Um, question: I always do ask you a question, but I currently have a very woofy corgi, to, uh, so I will add the question in in a second. Right. Woofy corgi has gone in for his lunch, <clears throat> hence he was woofy corgi. Now, question: There are always multiple options in this scenario. I can go divisive or inclusive. Um, I think I'm going to go for that question. With the Navigation Acts in terms of domestic focus in the UK on, to an extent, as I've mentioned, avarice, greed, but also on development of infrastructure, etc. Uh, of course, America is another famous country which has similar acts. Um, I think theirs is the Jones Act of 1920, which actually has a similar a similar, a similar sort of requirements and development process. I'd love to hear about people if you know about other countries which are similar and have their own policies which have gone through, like the Navigation Act, like the Jones Act, which have been structured, for want of a better phrase, to develop domestic industry. Now, it's something to think about, though, I'd say, and uh, this is a continuation of that question, because we have been since the end of World War Two, and certainly during the uh, certainly during the Cold War, and since the end of the Cold War, in a period of globalization and of movement of goods, now, movement of goods has been very important, and free trade, as in the movement of goods by whichever flag was available, shipping, was very important. However, one of the consequences you're probably going to have of Onboarding, or rather, uh, bringing a redomesticization of 
goods and of tra industry and in infrastructure and sort of deglobalization away as countries seek more self sufficiency. There are going to probably be countries which look at this and look at it and go, do we need to have a system to develop our own industry, to develop our own ability to move goods by sea? Because can we afford to be dependent upon another nation? It's worthwhile thinking about it. Panama, Liberia, the Marshall Islands, those are between them account for 31.1 plus 13.2 44.3% of the world's shipping. Once you add in Hong Kong, Singapore and China you are well well towards 60% of global shipping. Now that's fine. If you look at Panama, Liberia, and Marshall Islands, they don't have the ability to protect that shipping. Mostly they're dependent upon another nation and agreements with that nation to protect that shipping. So as long as they do what that nation wants and they don't cause any trouble, that's fine. But if they don't, then they have no way of protecting them. But also, Think about it from the perspective of the countries which are involved. You can have 74% of the world's global shipping, and this is in terms of <coughs> million dead weight tons, i.e. cumulative tonnage of those ships. Cumulative tonnage of the ships. 74% of the world's shipping is divided between Panama, Liberia, Marshall Islands, Hong Kong, Singapore, China, Malta, and Bahamas. And China really is, they're on 5.2%. They've got the same amount of flag pretty much as Malta has. As of 2022. Hong Kong, 207.8 million. Depends what you think about Hong Kong, Hong Kong shipping. When China and Hong Kong reunited, it was not just the island which goes with it, it's also the companies and their assets they own. So do you think nations might be considering again or might need to pursue this policy? Because they're sticking to the idea of, yeah, we can afford to be completely independent and not worry about this in a global, in a free trade, globalist economy where everyone's dependent on goods moving and goods are going to be freely guaranteed. And there's the period where they're not going to be. It'll be interesting. Thank you very much for watching. I hope you enjoyed, and um, take care.